All right, welcome back. So today we are going to add the capability of the character select. I have a preview of it just to kind of envision it, what it looks like first, and then we will add it to our project. We'll see where we're at at the moment, and then we will see how we can add this feature. So I have here just a very simple example, and then we'll add it to our particular project. So sometimes when you're doing your own projects, sometimes it's good to work on an empty document, on a new document. Sometimes it's useful to focus on an idea and kind of perfect the idea on its own before then adding it to your main project. Because when it's on your own main project, you have to deal with all the things that are already there to then add the new stuff. And especially when you're testing it, well, I have to go through seven screens of my project before I get to the new thing. That could be very slow in working on your project. So working on a new, project and then figuring out the code and the graphics and such, and then adding it to the new project is a good tactic. It is actually easier than you think because of the amazing tool of copy and paste we saw on Tuesday to add our little inventory item. If we create it properly on one scene on its own layer and then just copy the whole layer, well, it comes in with the graphic, with the instance name, with its position, etc. And then we pasted that layer onto every screen where we want the inventory, we're done with that. And then we saw with the actual code of it, if we did it a little bit more planned out where the main code is on frame one, scene one, and then the event listener is the only thing you need to copy and paste throughout, that's a very smart way to do things. So I've got an example here of the character select functionality that is only focused on the character select, nothing else works just the character select so that I can make sure it works and then I can add it to my project with some copy and paste. We'll do it together by hand, but I'll uh, show you what I mean here. So imagine we've got your game, you've got your intro screen, we go to start. Well, before we start the very first gate screen, let's select the character. So I've got here in this example, now the metaphors are all getting mixed up because we're in a haunted house and I kind of think of that as sort of in the modern times, but I'm putting characters here that are like wizards and warriors and a priest and a thief. So um, the metaphors are all getting mixed up. But each of these characters then has its own stats. We'll get back to the ideas about what the stats are for and such today. And so, okay, well, let's pick one. So let's say I pick the thief character. Obviously, I would further set up my screen so that the word thief appears or whatever graphics or animation I want. But at the very least, you see how the other ones fade out because I've picked that one. Okay, instead, I want to go with the warriors. I'll pick that one. The other ones fade out. Uh, maybe I'll pick the priest. And did you notice also, as soon as I picked one of the characters, the start to the game appeared. It's misspelled. But after you click on one of your characters, then you can proceed with the game. Technically, if you don't program it right, a person can start the game without picking a character, and then that'll cause weird things. It won't cause an error of syntax. It'll cause an error of logic. So not until I select the character do I then have the ability to start the game. So I start the game. Okay, we'll add this also, this, this cut scene that I've been saying. Right now, we've just been thrown into a particular scene, and okay, play the scene. We know what to do. We programmed it. We invented it. But when a person comes to play your game for the first time, they don't know what they're doing, especially on those scenes where there's that time limit. And suddenly this creature's coming at me, what's happening? And I'm dead because I didn't even think to fight back. So if we have a cut scene, which can be as advanced as you need it to be, as, as advanced as you want, at the very least, we will do our character says some plot point or whatever. In my case, well, it looks like the best way to get into this scary house is to try to open the front gate. So we're going to take advantage of a cutscene to make it say whatever we want, but probably a hint about how that particular scene works. All we need to do here is just go to the front door. This is as far as my demo works here. But if I then were to go to the next, I pass this scene, I go to the next scene, another cutscene appears, the character explains, okay, Let's try to get in the house. Maybe we can try the front door just like a moment ago, or maybe I could try to climb the tree. Oh, what's that rock over there? So, right, there's a plot. There's like hints happening in that um, cut scene that you can be as detailed as you wish. Of course, depending on the character that you chose, your cut scene 
will reflect that character. Let's say this time I select the mage. So when I start the game, the mage character will be throughout the game, not the priest. If I select the warrior, if I select Bill or Janet or however your characters are defined, <clears throat> they will appear in the game as necessary via the code. And you can take it all the way that depending on what the character stats are and such, the further amount of text or explanation or plot or cutscene is different based on the character. But this simple thing here that I'm demonstrating at this point, well, this takes dozens of lines of code. Let's see, actually, it takes... It takes ooh, 173 lines. So more than a few dozen. 173 lines just to get this basic part here to work. Again, this is not to discourage you, wow, this is so hard. No, it's like computers are dumb and we have to think in simple terms of logic and syntax and correct code in order for these basic things to work. We need to write this proper code. And then based on the code, it does what we want. As usual, I'll have this, we will have the output panel giving us some feedback. Look down there on the output panel. The game has started. There's some behind the scenes stats that are there regarding the various characters. I had said previously, there's gonna be a component of luck with some random numbers. In this particular case, the mage is luck 25, the warrior is 50, the priest is 75, the thief is 100. Just randomly, that's funny, it randomly put them in order, but it's random. And that could then be useful in the other parts of the game. Start the game, I'm in the next, I'm in the current, I'm in the correct scene. I pick a character. Then it's, you know, detecting what you've done. You've selected character one, which is the mage or I've selected character three, the priest, or four, or two, or whatever. So as usual there, I start, then we go to a cutscene where the currently selected character is there. There's something else about a timer, ignore that. We're not gonna get to that. But if we wanted to add a timer, you know, there's so many layers you can add to this project. You've probably played a game that if you pass the game in three hours, you get a certain ending. If you pass it within five hours, you get another ending. If you pass it within 12 hours, you get another ending. We're not going to get to that, but uh, I have a, I have code there about a timer, keeping track of time, and then, oh, the timer ended there. So, of course, we could do whatever we want, and it's not about intelligence. It's about time. Do you have the time to work on this for several hours a day throughout the weeks to make your vision come to life? The very least, our project here, we're adding a lot to it. A lot could be added to it, but it's we're, we're to a point where basically you've got a lot of ingredients and then you take those ingredients, you mix them together to make your project. Current ingredients are character select. All right, so we're gonna spend time on character select. As usual, this will take the form of graphical assets as well as, as code. So the first things to do here, visually, graphics-wise, at the moment when the game starts and I click Start, it goes to the first scene, the gate. Well, I need to have something happen before that, a cutscene. So I'm gonna create a new scene. I'm gonna give these cutscenes the same name as the main scene, but also with the word cutscene. So I will... Go to my window panel. Let's go to the window panel for your scenes. Scenes. Too many panels. Scenes. I'm sure it's there somewhere. Assets. Scenes. Or the sh keyboard shortcut, Shift F2, wherever it's at. So your scenes. Imagining it, where oh, there it is. It's hidden down here where there's my 
menu is so large, I didn't even see it. But anyway, keyboard shortcut, shift F2. All right, so I need a new scene. Near the gate scene, add a new scene. Scene, gate, cut scene. The order of these don't matter. If it's at the very end, it doesn't matter because via the code, we're jumping to the right place. I, however, personally like that my scenes are in the order of the logic of the game. Most likely, the game starts and you might go to help, or if not, you go from main screen to the first level. But we're going to go from the first scene to the cut scene, then the first level. But if they're in whatever order, it doesn't matter. I just need a scene. That needs to be set up with my layers, probably a background, my interactive elements, my code. These are my basic layers as a starting point on, on almost every scene, on this brand new scene. Almost always, the very first code that I need is my stop code. And then it's useful to also have the trace just to say uh, at the scene of gate cutscene, just so that if you see your message in the action script, you have better orientation of where I'm at in the project. Right, so we'll get to the code second. But now what I want to set up here is, okay, my various selectable characters. Um, you all did back on week one, the um, um, model sheet assignment with your character in the different poses and expressions and such. Um, but for the lecture, I'll just draw some original characters which may be easier or faster than you would like. But you can, of course, use the ones you did back on week one, make some new graphics, whatever you want. Um, I'm going to set this up on the interactive layer. And similar to everything else that I've been doing with the um, graphics, uh, if I start to draw something and then right away turn it to a symbol, then keep working on it. Because the way this will work is I will have one library item I'll have one library item where that one character is designed, and then that one character has its various other characters in the same symbol. And then depending on the character that I need to show, I show the right frame of that symbol. We've done that a few times where we had the various buttons, generic button, where we had the key, et cetera. Well, in this case, now it's going to be my character. So let's see here. I'm going to, just like my example, I'm just going to have some totally simple characters. Um, you know, this wizard guy. And he's got a wizard hat and stuff. And I'll figure out the details later. Let's say I've got one character. Before I get too complex with it, I'm going to turn that into a symbol. And then I'm going to uh, give it an instance name and all that good stuff as usual. So I'm going to select it, right click, convert to symbol, F8. This sprite characters, all my characters. Um, eventually, obviously, I could have lots of characters here. My idea is four characters, three characters, I don't know, whatever, two characters, seven characters, whatever. But they're all going to be grouped together in a symbol. So I'm creating a movie clip symbol for my characters. I have one of the characters. If I then double click to edit that symbol. What I'm going to do is that within the symbol, I'm going to have some frames where I will create four characters. 
So on their own blank keyframe, I'll create a character. And I want to use the onion skin mode so I can see the previous character. Because if I don't see what the other character look like looks like, I might make a character that just, you know, looks um, completely different proportion that doesn't look like it's the same in the same world of the characters. You know, if this is the average height of the character and I draw another character that's that big, is the character supposed to be that small or did I just draw it too small? So the point is that if you turn on the onion skin option, you can see your previous drawing. So I'm going to have uh, I'm going to have a wizard or a mage, a warrior, a priest, a thief. So okay, let's see. I do want the the warrior to be sort of like stronger guy, big muscles, and I'll figure out all the details of. Um, Drawing later, I just want to create some characters. With the example that I showed you previously, they were all different colors, but I can fix up all of that later. Character. Set up all the details later. Let's see, one more. So in my case, I'm kind of making them all generally the same sorts of sizes overall. Maybe the wire is the biggest one. Um, the mage and the priest are kind of like the same height or so. Then the thief is a little guy. He's going to sneak into the um, places a lot easier. So just got some characters. They'll be refined later. So pick this guy to be your main character or this one, her, or him, or whatever. So got some possible characters. Obviously, this is going to play as a... Once I add these on screen, it's going to play as a loop like that. So as usual... We need to add a stop. Um, add a stop code at the beginning so that it doesn't loop over and over. But each of the characters is in one symbol as many characters as I want. They're all in one symbol. In the select character screen, in the library, I put four copies of that symbol onto the screen. Size them some amount. Obviously, when I put the um, same symbol four times onto the screen, it's that it's all going to be frame one because in my symbol, frame one is that one character, but frame two has that character and frame three and frame four. 
So we've seen this, that via code, we can show a particular frame when we're on a particular scene. These four copies of that symbol all need an instance name. Once I have an instance name for each of them, then I can then I can show the particular character as necessary. So um, that first character instance name, I could call it SP as a sprite. It'll be my mage. Second character, warrior. Third, priest. Fourth, thief. So you see the repetition of things. Each, the, each, each is a copy of the same symbol. Sprite characters. Each one needs its own instance name. Do a quick, a quick and dirty test with control test scene instead of starting the whole game. Um, I just quickly want to see this scene, which is very incomplete. But if I control test scene, I can't debug a scene. I wish we could, but we can test one scene just to see it. We have the four characters. Then we'll write the code. So that obviously each of those four changes to the correct sprite. So in my code, in this scene after the stop, say set the right graphic for each instance. This sp sprite mage go to and stop frame one. This is redundant because it's automatically going to show frame one, but for completion. We have the sprite of the warrior, which I drew it as the second frame. Sprite priest. It's the third frame. The thief was the fourth frame. So why if I do control test scene, I can just quickly see that I type this properly. Did I type the instance names properly? Did I add instance names to the sprites? We're jumping to and stopping at a particular frame. Instead of running the whole project, I just want to see this one scene quickly. Not as quick as I would like, but this would still be a little bit quicker than trying to run the whole game where it also has to process and, and run and compress the sound. Then I have to go through the screens. Okay, so that's the point there. They were all, of course, the same, that one um, sprite, but then the um, go to and stop of each of these with a particular frame shows a particular character. I have to still resize them a little bit. I'll worry about that later. It is annoying that you will not be able to see the actual graphic when you're editing it, not until you run the code. Do you then see where they're aligning up and the arm of this one is covering the arm of that one? That'll be for fine tuning it later. But the point is that each of these is appearing properly. As I said, I don't want to proceed from this screen to the first level until I've selected a character. So we're gonna have a button, start the quest, but that button won't be active and usable until we've selected a character. Because you could, if you don't program it right, select to start the game, but not selected a character. So I'm gonna make a button here to start the game borrow from my generic buttons, the same sort of idea. In here, I've got all of these various types of buttons. 
symbol. What's that? No, this is for the button so that we can use different, the same button, but for different purposes. So let's see, this one is going to be to start. Start. fix it later. But the point is that is that within this particular uh, scene right here, I'll have the, let's start the game. Actually, I don't want it to say start, I'll make it say go. I already have one that says start, this one will be go. But in my case, this is frame six. And therefore, I needed to say frame six. So the same thing that I did with these sprites here, they need an instance name, and they need the code that says show frame six, which is my start, which is my go button. So that needs an instance name. Call this BTN. It's just BTN go gate. I already call that. Did I already use that before? Uh, game start now. Okay. So um, here, instance name go gate. Then my code. Go gate, show the sixth frame in my case. I have a button that I've designed for the purpose of uh, showing that action. I grouped all my buttons into its own symbol, just like I grouped all my characters into its own symbol. And it's just a matter of um, showing the proper frame as necessary. That's one of the things that I like um, with like Adobe Animate or most apps. You can group, it's known as a sprite sheet. You can group together sprites or graphic as one thing and then just show the particular thing necessary. Instead of having seven objects in the library, I have one. And in that one, I've got the seven and I just show the proper one. Of course, it can be done that, yeah, I've got those seven graphics as their own symbol, and then I put a copy of it onto the stage as necessary. Same end result, but internally one is different than the other. And so there's going to be a button to go. But again, I don't want to go until I've selected character. So the proper symbol needs to be shown, but also that gate go to the first scene is visible false. I don't want that button to be visible, to be interactive yet until they've chosen a character. I want the, I want the button to be ready eventually. But when the scene starts, I don't want that button to be active until they've chosen a character. confirming that there we go so the button is there but you can't see it you can't click on it until you select a character and it will appear so this is still all of our setup um further setup is that if i do play my game at this moment this scene does not appear of course because i didn't program it 
to appear yet. It exists, but this character select doesn't exist yet or does it, doesn't yet, isn't accessible yet. Because on my title screen, my start button is programmed to go a while ago to the gate. Well, then obviously, if I want to select the character first, I need it to go to the proper scene, and then from there, go to the gate. So we made a brand new scene. So you need to change this back on your title scene. Your button of game start, it needs to go to scene gate cutscene. It's a brand new scene that we made where your characters are at. So that, if you don't change that, that is not a syntax error. You'll get no errors, of course. That's a logic error, of course, because logically I want to go to the character select before I start the game. And if I never programmed it, it won't do it. And it's not going to pop up with any error to tell you, you you forgot your character scene. Syntax errors are going to pop up and tell you to fix it. Logic errors almost never never are going to pop up to somehow tell you you did something wrong. You know, the logic of things, there's no computer smart enough to tell you you've made a logic error. They can tell you a syntax error easily, but not a logic error. So when I click start, I go to the cutscene. So why did I call this cutscene? Um, I'm not thinking. This should not be cutscene. Sorry, this should be character select. Uh, the cutscene will be the cutscene where the character explains that scene. So, okay, name the, these names don't matter, but uh, whoops, that's a little mistake there. Uh, so that should not be gate cutscene. That should be scene character select. Scene characters. Sorry about that. Um, again, this is a logic error, not a syntax error. So the scene where you select character should be named something that makes sense, scene character. So make sure you change that. Then on the title, the button, make sure that the button goes to scene characters, not cutscene. I was getting ahead of myself. Title, characters is why I do the lecture and speak out loud because then I'm also listening to myself. Did I say it right? And I realized I didn't. So you click the button to start the game, which first goes to the character's screen selector. Select the character, then that goes to the cutscene. Cutscene is done, then we go to the first level. Should work no problem, but I'll run it anyway. It's a good idea to check your code, even though you don't think you might need to. But I still should. And while that's loading up, what's coming after this is we're going to uh, edit some code on the title screen um, and then add more code on the character select screen and then proceed from that. So point is that the game starts and now we have a new functionality. Pick a character. You pick a character in a moment, the button to actually go to the gate will be will appear. We click that. We'll have the cutscene. Then after that, we'll have the gate. So what we need to do here on this title, we started to let's see here character select code. So far, I had as a reminder this random luck generator, which we need to update a little bit. Then we had, okay, one particular character, second character, third character. I have a fourth character, so I'll add a fourth character. Um, so we need to update that a little bit. Okay, so first, with this uh, random code, uh, random luck generator, Part of the reason to have this bit of code here is because this gives replay replayability to your game, that it's not the same thing all the time. If there's a little bit of randomness here and there, 
the game will be different. Even if they pick the exact same thing, the exact same character next time, if we add also a little bit of randomness like luck, that can change the game. Now, very important here, I'll make a note, make it very big, important, make it very obvious. Hopefully this means here that you see it. Very important, change the return type. And what does that mean? Um, from array to number. Uh, when we wrote this code a couple of weeks ago, I had set it up this way, but then I figured out there's a better way to do this. So we have to change this. If you don't change this, you're going to get an error. And the error is not going to make sense. But the error is trying to tell you your, your, your uh, return type is wrong. What data does it return? How does it respond to you? Right now, this random luck generator responds to you in the form of an array. We don't need the array. We need the, we need the number. We need one of these numbers. We don't need the whole collection of numbers. Uh, so we're going to say number. When I use this code, I want it to respond to me with one of these possible numbers. Technically, what it did a moment ago is it responded with all the numbers. But we want one of those numbers. I also want to change this null to 10. I want all my characters to have some amount of luck, even bad luck, 10 units. If we set it to null, that's not going to really do what I want. So now right here, this character can be very lucky, very unlucky, kind of lucky, kind of not lucky, kind of a little lucky. With null, it'll be not doing what I want. Or change. One more changes over here. Okay, well, we need to have we need to have the code pick one of those. We had set it up that we picked. Give me luck number two. Give me luck number one. Give me luck whatever. That's not random. So we're setting ourselves up that we're going to create a random number out of these possibilities. Where I had my note here, make it actually lucky. Something like this already with a little bit of random numbers. R array luck picked colon number. We have possibly of one or two or three or four or five. Five possibilities to pick from randomly. Floor. And the way it picks random numbers is between zero and one. But we needed to pick between one and five. But an array is counted from zero. We've said this before, so it's you know the first item, the second item, the third item, but it's referred to as Item zero, item one, item two, item three, item four. Floor will let us pick from the bottom, zero and up. Is here math.random. That's going to be picking the zero to one, but I need from one to five but actually from zero to four, so times five, this is basically saying from, from zero to five, we need from zero to four. So yeah, it's weird, computers are weird, but this is gonna pick a number between, this is gonna pick a number between one and five, but technically between zero and four. It's gonna pick one of those. Here, return array of luck brackets array luck picked. So when I use my random luck generator, there's five to pick from. One of these possibly and then return it. So it's going to be 10 or 50 or 75. 
based on the positions of zero to four. Lastly, the um, actual character object here needs to be changed just to say random luck. A moment ago when I told it, give me luck one, give me luck four. Well, that was not random. Now that I've set up randomness, now it will randomly pick one of these. You may have a, uh, characters that all of them have perfect luck of 100. Or these four characters, they may randomly have 25, 75, and 10. But out of these possibilities, people have, your characters will have one of these lucks. So, of course, then that character also needs to be changed. That character needs to be changed. I got the idea that I want to have four characters to choose from, so I need a fourth character. Same sort of idea. Create a variable, give it some sort of character type, which is an object. It's got a name, a type, hit points, magic, power, luck. Copy that chunk of code. Brand new character, priest. type, some kinds of values that I put in here, but then um, I have some values here that I lock in, and then I've got a value that changes every time you play because we created a random luck generator. characters to choose from in this game. Various stats. I can create way more stats, of course. Less stats, of course. I can add random stats, one or more if I want. Like all of these right here, I've set them up that these are all locked in. Even though I called this code random luck, I could reuse this this subroutine, this chunk of code, I could reuse this whenever I want to pick a random value of 10, 25, 50, 75, or 100. So that's what all of these are, basically. So I could set it up that all of these will be random. I'm not going to do this. It's way too random, maybe. But I'm just showing you the possibilities here. This subroutine, also known as an algorithm, this chunk of code has a purpose of, of selecting one of these possibilities. That's all it does. How then you use those possibilities is up to you. In my case, my characters are all have these stats. And I've shown that if you can set up one with one of those random stats, you know, what if I call it random stats instead of random luck, then it makes sense that pick a random stat for each one. Again, these, not, these names don't matter. I could call this kitty cat. If I call that function kitty cat, then I call my function, I use my function kitty cat four times here. And then now this character has random stats four times. I'm gonna leave it as I had it before that I put specific stats for specific characters. But if you further want more randomness in the characters, you have a random generator. Random, you have in you have an RNG engine here, random number generator. We had some trace commands there just to kind of see some of this. This is optional, but if you want to see, you can say trace the warrior luck. Warrior C luck, the warrior, the warrior character's luck. Want to see the priest, then it's the priest character, their luck, the thief character, their luck. Spelled as is. 
as is. This is power of that character, trace. The command was the same as this, I just deleted it. Um, so there's still some setup, but if I test this scene, it should, actually does it show on the console? this usually again towards the end of the semester things are slower make sure you're saving on a regular basis just in case there's a crash and this is happening and it might happen more often as we've added sound to our project sound really um, sets up a lot it uses a lot of memory anyway i just wanted to see the output here so all the stuff from before and then okay so random luck is running four times well that makes sense. I defined four characters. Each of those four characters has some amount of luck. So therefore that code, that subroutine, that function ran four times. And then my trace, well, we've seen this before, but here's the part the mage's luck randomly this time chose 25. The warrior got luck of 10, the priest of 10, and the thief of 50. So lucky thief. Then the rest of the code. So that's working so far. I made my random generator actually random, so I made a change. Again, make sure you change that to number and not array. That'll get an error. Uh, then we added this here that creates the random number, and then we changed that return value there. And then we changed the lock here where we took away the number. Make sure you take that away. Lastly, um, lastly, with on, within all of this character setup, one more thing. So array to keep track of selected or code to keep track which character selected. It's one thing to create the code about what you're, what you, what you're trying to do, but then for it to remember and to apply in other parts of the game, you further have to program that. And so I need to keep track of it. So just by clicking it on the screen doesn't mean anything. You have to then keep track of it in memory. So once again, another variable, another object to keep track of. This is character all. So all my characters, I have four to choose from. And then data type is an array. It's a collection of data. That is equal to square brackets. Say null, comma, quotes mage, comma, quotes warrior, comma, quotes priest, comma, code, quotes thief. Well, that's just me reiterating. I've got four characters. They have some name. You know, the name, I chose that the names are right here. This this is where I could have called it, you know, Janet or Zaxor or whatever. So this type of, this character has these properties. But this character, I'm keeping track of it here, all my characters. Now, I put null here because, again, when you deal with an array, you start with zero. But I think to make it easier... I don't want to deal with zero. I want to start to count one, two, three. My first character is the mage. My third character is the priest. If I put null on zero, I don't have to deal with zero. I can just think of my third character is the priest. Two, three. My fourth character is the thief. Right? One, two, three, four. We have zero. We we have to we have to know that we count from zero, but I don't want to deal with zero. So we'll put a null there, so I don't have to remember to pick zero. But then if I pick character number one, okay, character number one, the mage. Character selected, which is a string. 
which is equal to nothing at the moment. No character has been selected. That's what I'm saying. I'm setting all of this up on scene one, frame one, so that when I get to the character select screen, these things can be properly selected. That I selected character three, which is the priest. So I'm gonna be keeping track of that the priest has been selected. The priest character is gonna be in the game so that when I need to check, okay, what you're gonna battle this thing based on luck. Okay, the priest currently has a luck of seven. So this is to keep track of which one was selected. Set up here and then update in C characters, the character select screen, characters scene. So some setup here before it actually works. Get all of that visual stuff to set up and then some code stuff. And then we have also some other visual stuff to set up. We're getting to our first break here in a moment. Just confirm there's no errors in my code at this point, then we'll take a break. This is all to set up. character selections so that then it could affect the game. And as always, easier said than done. And that is not to discourage you, just that this takes time, this takes effort, this takes testing, this takes fixing. Yet this advanced, this is one of the most advanced classes we offer at the college. Lots of programming, lots of advanced stuff. So all of that looks normal, no errors. Game is ready. I haven't gotten the skull key yet. I've generated four lux, four characters. The mage character is luck 25, warrior 10, priest 25, thief 75. Looks good. If I then proceed to the next screen to select a character, pick character one. That was the point again. You got null, one, two, three, four. When I pick character one, it will load its stats, basically. Or instead, I want to go with character four. It'll load the fourth character's stats. Once I pick the character, then I will go start the game, which will then be a cutscene. Our character will appear on screen to say wise words. Then the game will start. So we're getting there. But at this point, it's coming together. So uh, we'll round up. We'll say it's 12.55. We'll take a 10-minute break. So one o five. Have the rest of this code so that it works properly. So we'll be back at one fifty five.
right, let's continue. So we're setting up here to be able to select one of these characters. We set up some basic things on the first scene, the title scene, but then in the character select scene is where more stuff happens. So if I go back to the character select screen, what's happening at the moment is the um, various frames of the characters are being shown. Play the game button is being hidden. Okay, so the idea here is character is clickable, then updates the selected code. That's back on the first scene. There's a there's the variable that's keeping track which was selected at the beginning. It's null. No character's been selected, so that's got to be updated. Um, we're going to do it the same way that we've done several things already in that something is clickable and then code runs. So I'll grab, copy and paste as usual, the um, chunk of code that I've had before. Uh, let's see, the code where, right here, my usual chunk of code where something is clickable, that exact same idea is gonna happen in the, is gonna be a starting point in the character select, it's gonna be clickable and it's gonna run some code. We're gonna change it slightly though, something brand new here, because we're thinking of something more complex, a character which has all these various stats. Um, we've had click on something, run some code and do something. Well, we're gonna set our code up so that it's a little bit more generic in terms of any one of these four characters, click on them. And based on the one you clicked, the function itself will be a little different. So it'll be the same first that you're clicking on something, but then the custom function, here's where it's going to be a little different. Now, also what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this to the next line because it's going to be longer. So just to be able to read it, this custom function, I'm going to move it to the next line over here. Uh, this is happening after the comma, but instead of this custom function, it's going to have parentheses data one, comma data two. So all along, we've clicked on something to run a function. We didn't need to deal with any more data. Just click the thing, do the thing. These characters have more data to them. So we need to say run some function with some amount of data. Automatically behind the scenes without paying attention, it was already in a sense, it was already keeping track of data one automatically because there was the event that we tapped it, that we touched it, that we interacted with it. But now we need to provide data two or more data or things that we're doing. Uh, in this case, the actual info here will be event and then comma one. The first character, the second character, third character, fourth character. So the order of these does matter. Uh, if I set up my characters in the order of mage, warrior, thief, priest, well, your order is going to be different. It's going to be one, two, four, three, or whatever. So the order of these, one, two, three, four, matters. And what I'm saying is I'm about to run some code of a tap, comma, and it was the first one that I clicked on. In a moment, when I do the warrior, I'm not done yet, but when I do the warrior, that'll be the second character. It should make sense. The third character, etc. It's not done yet, however. The mage is the first character. In order for this updated code to work here, however, it needs to further be changed a little bit. Before, when we didn't specify any extra data, we just had it say the name of the function, the end. But now we're making it say two pieces of data. So our custom function is gonna have the usual event, touch event, but then now comma, 
character number, colon number. We're trying to run this function it's, and it's on the event of a tab and it's specifically character one. So this function is based on a tap and which number you clicked on. The change there. Note, very important, the second parameter, that's called a parameter, we always had the event touch event, always. Now here's a brand new item for this advanced concept where now we're dealing with the number of the character, one, two, three, four. So we have that second parameter here. Lastly, in order for this to fully work, we need one more thing. For that, let's say function, parentheses, curly braces. I'm writing it here. Think function event and curly braces. So all of this is technically on the same line over here, but I just moved it to the next line so you can see it. I moved it to the next line. This is 99% of the way we've done it over and over already. Something to interact with with a touch. This time it's special because we also have to specify which one we clicked on. We have this pre pre-code here, but this curly brace is where this function should be. I wrote it completely here to show you it's a function, parentheses event, curly braces, that's that. But inside of here, inside of the curly braces is where you have to do the command, run the command, use the command of the function, of the custom function. Put it out like that, just to explain it. But then inside is the actual function. So just to space it out for readability. Again, this is all on one line. If I zoom out, you know, it's all, it's, that's, that's all one command, but I moved it to the next line just to be readable. It's a function, there's an event, which is the, which is the tap, run some code. It's two parameters. The function, the, the custom function here, of course, that's, that's where we, we're going to have our named function here, as we've always done. As we've always done, there's been an event of touch, but now there's also keep track of which character I clicked on. One, two, three, four. Fill names here. F and character or select. Which is here, as always. As always, this break down to the next line. Note, here's our end. Here's our trace, as always. Now we can trace a second thing. Um, character number. Character number. Just so that we see internally, okay, I did click on the third one. This is again to try to figure out if we ever get any logic errors. Uh, I'm clicking on the priest, but it's loading up the stats of the warrior. Well, one way to figure out if it's all working is because did are we using the correct number? I've got my my character one, two, three, four. If I have them in a different order, and then I wrote, you know, character number right here four. Well, yeah, I'm loading, I'm loading the stats of the fourth character, but onto the first character. So here I'm tracing, I'm just confirming the number matches what I think I'm clicking on.
behind the scenes, we have our array that we set up back on the first scene. It's character all. We have the array of character all, all the um, four characters, but the one that we care about is the one that we picked. And therefore we're saying here, um, oops, actually, sorry, character selected, all the possibilities of characters, but the one that got selected is equal to from the whole array of possibilities, the one that is the character number, one, two, three, or four. You got four characters. You've either selected character one, two, three, or four. So the character that was selected, one of those numbers, one, two, three, or four. Click on the mage, well, it's character one. So what I've selected is character one. All my characters, character number one is the mage, right? We count from zero, that's why there's nothing there. Character one is the mage. You can, of course, see that on the trace as well. Car selected was whatever that was. Now, all of this is um, is in the, all of this is getting set up for the, for the first character, the, from left to right, the first character on the left, um, or characters to choose from. I'm setting up this function, however, in a generic way. That was my very first crash ever. Okay, so let me restart that. Um, but all of the uh, characters are, gonna need to be clickable. So far, I've only set up the mage to be clickable. And set up the mage to be clickable. Save here, it recovered, everything looks good. Let me just save as on that recovery. Right, so um, what I was saying was we've only set up the mage to be clickable. I've got the other ones to be clickable. So this whole chunk right here, I need four copies of that for each of my four characters. But if I set it up, if I start to set it up properly one time, I can do the easy copy and paste. All four of those characters are going to reuse the same character select subroutine, the same function. That's why we've further programmed to care about which one got clicked on, to know which one got clicked on. So that function itself changes based on which one you clicked on. We set it up here for the first time with a second parameter. Okay, but I need the other three characters to also be clickable. So I'm gonna select the code and change it to my other characters. The warrior is the second selectable character. So of course I'm changing which one, which sprite am I clicking on, which is associated with the second character. And third sprite or third character. It's the third character. The fourth character. the fourth character. All four are now clickable. All of them have an event listener. All four of them are clickable. We've set up our, um, our character select function to also know which one you clicked on, one through four. 
therefore, when I click on the um, particular character, this code will run. I'm going to run my code just to make sure it's OK so far. The code's not complete yet. But internally, on the, on the output panel, it should be showing me which one I'm clicking on whenever I click a particular one. Let's see. So when the project starts, so output there. In this case, I got that amount of luck. The thief this time is not lucky. And so we start, we go to the selector. If I click on the first character, the feedback is that that was character number one, the mage. If I click on this third one, I clicked on the third one, the priest. I clicked on the first one, the mage. The second one, the warrior. The fourth one, the thief. So it is detecting which one you clicked on. One of them has got the event listener. Each one of them is a is associated with number one, two, three, four. Therefore, we know which one we've dealt with, character number four, and such. Oh. Start variables to the one that was picked. Highlight the one that's picked. You get any feedback on screen, that's the one I picked. And there's many ways to do this, of course. But the way I'm going to do this is the main one that I picked is going to get highlighted. The other ones are going to fade out. The other ones are going to get faded out so that you see, oh, this is the one that I picked. You know, the other, one can, the other ones can turn black and white, and then the, my main character is, stays in color. That's a technique you often see when you're doing character selections. Or, you know, the others get faded out and the one that got selected got brighter. That's another way to do it. Highlight the one that's picked based on a conditional statement. Statement, we've talked about those before. We've used those to make a decision, to make a choice, if else. There's more than one conditional statement. I've been saying a conditional statement. What I mean by that is one of the possible conditional statements. There's like four or five different types of statements to make a decision, pick a choice, et cetera. We've used if else, that works, that has worked fine for us this whole time. We could probably still also use it here, but instead I'm gonna use a different one, a new one called using a switch statement to decision. Clicked on the third character, therefore do this. You've clicked on the fourth character, therefore do that. So that can be done with if else, but switch, we kind of switch between possibilities. We switch between the first or the third or the second or whatever. So the code for that, the syntax is switch, lowercase, and it's got its curly braces. Curly braces, we break it apart. The character selected, sorry, the character number, character number, number one, two, three, four, switch between character numbers, switch between one, two, three, or four, or three, or two, or one, or four. So switch has cases, case of one, case of two, case of three, case of four. I've got four characters. In case you picked the third character, do something. In case you picked the first character, do something else. So we've set ourselves up that the particular characters are associated with one, two, three, or four. Switch is going to make a decision, a condition, a statement, 
based on a condition, check what number they click to what character they click, which is based on a number. If is if it is character number two, run some amount of code. Break. It's done. If they clicked on the fourth character, run some amount of code and then break. They're similar. They're exactly the same. Some amount of code for each of these and then we break. Don't do case three. If, if you picked character one, do the code of character one and don't do anything of character two, three, or four. That makes sense. Break, stop, don't do more code. You've done the right code for the mage. Don't run the other code. It doesn't make sense. Each of these is a little section like that. Case, it's got the number, the colon, one or 100 lines of code, and then break. So nothing else runs. Piece of one, which is the mage, the sprite of the mage, it's alpha is one. The sprite of the warrior, it's alpha is very low, 0 0.25. The sprite of the priest is alpha, it's also very low. The sprite of the thief, it's alpha is very low. So alpha is the transparency. Alpha technically goes from zero to one. Zero is something is invisible. One is completely visible. And anywhere in between is some amount of transparent. One quarter transparent, one half transparent, three quarters transparent, fully transparent, or fully visible, sorry, going the other way. Okay, zero is fully transparent, 25% more visible, 50% more visible, 75% more visible, one more visible, 100% visible. You can do 1.0 if you want. You Things like 0 0.01. You're not going to be able to keep, you're not going to notice the difference between 0 0.01 and 0 0.02. Those values are so similar, you're not going to see any difference. I think it's good enough that you think in terms of 25, 25 percentages, 0, 25, 50, 75, 100. You're going to see those differences. I guess you can go in 10% as well. Okay, it's 10% visible versus 30% visible. You're going to possibly tell the difference if they're side by side, but obvious visibilities, I think, are better. And what's happening here is, well, if you've clicked on the wizard, the mage, which is the first character, the mage will be completely visible. The other ones will fade out. If I click on the second character, well, the second character will be 100%, and the other characters will be 25%. So we need to do that here. So why not copy and paste? So the mage is going to fade out. I didn't select the mage. Mage is one. Warrior is two. So that one's 100%. Click the, the mage, the other three fade out. If I click the warrior, the other three fade out. If I click, click the priest, the other three fade out. Click the fourth character. The three fade out. All that this is doing is just in charge of fading out the other characters. It could be set up to do more. It could play a sound. It could do many things. At least visually here, something fades out. This could also be set up that certain text appears on screen. I'd be more set up than I want to do at the moment. But if I were to click the mage, the text you selected, the mage, could appear within the section of this case. If you selected the third character, you could further have code that says you selected the, the, the priest, you know, based on, you could do anything, of course, but easier said than done. This is enough to, that, that we get some feedback that the one that I selected is selected. 
based on conditional statement, highlight the one that's picked, fade out the others, switch. This is a new conditional statement, a new way to make decisions. If you know how many to choose from, you can make cases for them. This could be set up in different ways, like you're trying to get points. Um, you know, you have high score, some way to keep track of the, the high score. And you say, you know, when you reach 1,000 points, do that. When you reach, uh, when you reach the, um, you know, 7,000 points, do 7,007 points, do that. This can be set up in other ways as well. Like, let's say, username. Let's say you've got a variable that is keeping track of the username, who's playing the game, whatever. And if there's a character, if there's a user of, you know, Bill, in case the character Bill is detected, do the following. It's not limited to just fading things out, of course. You can do anything. Just saying that. If the admin logs in, okay, unlock all the treasure so you can debug your game. Whatever user logged in, if it detects it was the admin, set up something. You collected all the keys. The switch statement here is very useful when you know the possibilities. There are four possibilities. An if, if else statement is a little bit more when you don't know the exact possibility, because we had, is it less than this? Is it greater than that? but this is when you know the exact capabilities. And then there's some nice feedback there about what that could be used for. Thank you for that. In our case, it's either character one, two, or three, or four. We fade out the characters that are not picked. This switch ends. We've got one more thing. Then show the uh, go to gate button. So when we start this scene, the button is invisible, not until you select the character, but we've set up the code, make all characters clickable, make the code that detects which one was selected, fade out the ones not selected, and then show the button. You've selected one, we're ready to start. Button is waiting for us there to go to the next scene. The button is waiting for us, but the button doesn't do anything. It doesn't have the event listener. It doesn't have the function. It doesn't have the go to and play yet. But again, we're building up little by little. So now that the button is visible outside of the function of selector, um, make button clickable. Is the usual of event listener stuff. It's the usual. Some button will be clickable to run some code. It's a simple click button, nothing like the character one where we had to add the extra parameter. The thing we've done over and over. It's real info, of course, well, the gate, go to the gate is what now is clickable, some code, actually BT go gate cutscene. Now I need a cutscene. But this is um, our character selector. We set up all the parameters, all the attributes of the character back on title scene. We've now here set it up that visually someone picks the particular character and 
we're, we're going to keep track of it, their stats. That's all basically happening right here. We're keeping track of the stats. The currently selected character. Got a button waiting for us now to go to the cutscene. I will start to apply this character selected. We're going to have a cutscene where the where the particular character is speaking to you. Selected one of the four characters, so the cutscene will have one of those four, and it will know which of those four because of this select select screen. So in the, I uh, need a new scene. Uh, I, now I will create the cutscene for the gate. Gate cutscene. I haven't tested it yet. I haven't tested it. Before we move to that new scene, uh, I want to test the part about I'm trying to select. Oops, I mistyped something there. Username. Uh, that was just some example code. So, yep, yeah, remember, test your code before you go forward. I know I left the username on the switch, which is wrong because there's no such thing as username. I need to put that back to there's selected character number. As I was thinking out loud, I changed it, but I didn't change it back. That is character number. Clicked on one of the characters. It has a number, and you switch between the numbers. Okay, that was a little mistake there. But putting that back. Let's see here. So with this new switch, now that I click on the different characters, the one you selected gets highlighted. The one that is not selected gets faded out. The button to proceed should appear. It'll be hidden when the level starts. Here we go. No crash. All right, so I start, I go to the character select. I click on a character. The other ones fade out. The go appeared. Actually, I want to go with this character. The other ones fade out. I drew mine that Again, here, this character is not complete, so I'm trying to click on the character. It's not selecting. Well, I drew it quickly because only the lines are clickable. I obviously want to fill in colors so that if I click on the character's chest, it gets clicked. But just because I drew them as outlines, only the lines are clickable. So I select the, the thief. My, my output down here is res, uh, re, uh, responding. You selected the fourth character, which is the thief. If I click go, it's just going to zoom past the scene. Skate is running. Okay. Uh, did I? 
so the code, um, wait, I didn't finish the code. <laughs> so uh, the button is running. And what is the finished code? Well, that's the part about movie clip. Root, go to and play. Frame one of the scene, gate, cutscene. Scene, gate, cutscene, yeah. So the gate that is clickable move us to frame one of that scene. I'm gonna trust that it works. I don't wanna waste time to test it. I should, but I'm gonna go on. So. Um, the gate cutscene. Just set myself up here with the stop code. My usual layers. So my idea for this is that the um, particular character screen, it will know which character to show. There will be some text on screen. which is a plot point or a hint of that scene, et cetera. I'll write it with some just plain old text. Let's try to get in by going to the Eight. We want it to say different words again. That, of course, can be programmed depending on which character you're at. Uh, I think we'll have time for that. But at least I wanted to uh, show the right character speaking because you've selected a certain character. So um, that sprite will need to change. That will need an instance name. This is the heads up display character sprite. As soon as we get to the scene, we need to um, show the selected character that instance. That instance go to and stop. Previously, we said, okay, show me the third frame of that of that key, which is the skull key or show me, you know, the sixth button, the sixth frame of that button, which is the restart. Well, I, of course, cannot program it. Show me the, show me the mage. If they selected the warrior, that's going to say, show me the mage. The whole point of, of having the variable keeping track of which one was selected was to then use it here, which is called the selected. When we selected the character back here, that's the first thing that happened here. You selected a character. Character selected is the number one, two, three, four. Character one, two, three, four. 
inside of that sprite that frames one, two, three, four. So we know which one they clicked. They clicked item three. Therefore, character selected has the value three. So it knows to display the third character. If I clicked the third character, So wherever I want to display the character that I have selected, it's going to be that kind of a code. There's an instance of it on the screen with some instance name. We're going to then jump to a specific frame. The specific frame is being kept track of in that variable. That variable is set when they select the character, so it'll keep remembering it throughout the whole game. They've selected the character. There's only one chance to select the character so far. They've selected the character. It's keeping track of character one. Therefore, we can always show the proper character whenever we need to with that variable. Select the thief. Start the game. I should have checked my code. I mistyped it. So it's saying I mistyped what? What is not found in the scene? Oh, okay, yes, yes, that's one more thing. Uh, okay, I see that. Okay, so it's not, it is a it is a syntax error. It's also a logic error. Uh, here's what we did wrong. One more thing. This. To do this, I want to keep my thought easy. Character selected is a string, not a number. Okay. Uh, fine. Okay, so here's what's happening. I was saying it's it's frame one, two, or three, or four. Normally, we would say, yeah, show me frame two. And I say, okay, this variable is going to represent frame two. Um, not exactly, because in the character select here, um, Have an answer, but do this by the number or that. Um, it might be dear just to change this one thing here. Um, let's do it this way. Hopefully, this doesn't affect anything down the line. But okay, instead, um, instead of on the line right here, I'm going to keep a copy of it. I'm going to keep a copy of it. Uh, I want to go back to my old code. Um, instead, I'm going to make it say like this. Sorry. Oh, number. There we go. So we're changing it slightly. So it's keeping track of, of the number now. Slightly different than here is keeping track of the name of the character. I don't know if it's actually more valuable to keep track of the name or the number. Logically, for a human, I would want to keep track of the name, but I should think of it as a number because the computer thinks of it as a number. This again, computers are dumb. I know that I, when I mean the warrior, I mean the warrior, but the computer thinks, oh, you mean character one. So I guess we might as well keep it track of in numbers. The character that was selected was the number one. This was saying the character that was selected was the warrior. That could, of course, work if you further program it, but you see you're running into this error that I'm showing there. Because the error was saying, uh, go to and stop 
not a frame, but a, but a name. Uh, this sprite is set up with numbers, one, two, three, four. It could be set up with frame one is named mage, frame two is named warrior, frame three is named priest, and frame four is named thief. That's an extra step, naming your frames. We, we haven't done it in class. I don't think we need to. If we just know, okay, one, two, three, four. So I'm going to go back and change my code there. Um, just keeping track of the number of the frame, eventually not the name of the frame. We would have to name the frames, which we haven't, which we won't. So we'll keep track of the numbers. The character selected is a number, character one, two, three, four. Now, when we're over here, we're saying, show me frame three not show me frame priest. So that is what that error was. It uh, didn't know which frame to jump to because it's expecting to jump to a frame named thief. Frames are not named, they are numbered. Whoops, that caused something else. Okay, let's deal with that. So this is what I thought that maybe if something gets changed, it'll change something else. Let me just confirm that. Loads up. The coercion of a value type number to an unrelated string. Okay, one more thing to change. Uh, the data type. So I had it at the at the very beginning saying that the character selected is going to hold a string, which is a word. So the name of the character, mage, warrior, priest, is a string. Um, a moment ago, I was then saying character selected is going to be equal to one. Well, one is not a string, one is a number. But this variable is saying this variable will hold words or strings. Um, and to force it, that's what the error is. Here, I'm now trying to force it. That variable is now holding a number. That variable was designed to hold strings or words. So I'm uh, going to go back and change this one in the frame, in the title screen. Title screen, that'll say, okay, I'm keeping track of numbers. Selected character is a number. Number one, two. Say, put a number into that variable, it will accept it. A moment ago, I was trying to put a number into a string, it won't accept it. That doesn't affect anything else. Great thing about programming is that you ask 10 programmers how to do something, they'll give you 11 answers. The bad thing about programming is that you ask 10 programmers to give you an answer, you get 11 answers. Everyone's got an answer or multiple answers and all the answers are correct and they're all incorrect as long as they do the end result. My end result is I want to display my character properly on screen and I first thought about doing it with strings, but then and I have said, okay, I'll do it with numbers. Both could be done, but they need their extra code. And I think it's mostly set up correct here just to use numbers. Thought I was going to be fancy with names, but keep it simple with numbers. Let's see. Let's see. So... Start that, pick the thief, character four, go. There we go. So then the thief. Let's try to get in by going to the closed gate. Instead, I rerun it. This time, choose the warrior. Give an error this time, but not last time. Let 
was the old error that wasn't canceled. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, this time I'll select a different character, the warrior. Warrior. Let's try to get in by going to the closed gate. Obviously, we need the button to go to the actual gate. It's easy. Scene. We could set it up as a. We could we could set it up as a timer after you've read it. I guess that's too complicated. Um, let's have a button here. After they read, they go. They go next, and then the um, the gate actually starts. So I'll just reuse my button here. Keep it simple. Just keep it there. It's a an instance name. Is the whole event listener code as usual? I have a copy of it from over here. At before, just the usual. And the important part is we go finally to the gate. Of the gate scene. Next button is listening to be clicked on. Add the text that this selected character told us. The hint of what we might do. Did my code there. And that's going to give me an error. Um, this is when you name your functions very, very simple, um, simple names. It's saying you're you're reusing the same name. Yeah, probably related there. So I've already called something go next. So okay, let's call it. Go next for real. Again, these things could be called whatever you want. You can just call it kitty cat. These things could be called whatever you want. It's called at the moment whatever, whatever works. Just to skip that error message, I, I must have previously created a function called go next somewhere. I don't remember where, and. Um, Therefore, it's complaining you're recreating the same function. Well, obviously, that function previously created had some purpose, so I'll leave it alone. I'll call this new function anything else. And uh, it seems to have avoided the error. This is just another instance of another button to click on to go to another scene. We've done that over and over, nothing special. Although the other things we have covered today, yes, are brand new and different and special. As I said on Monday, though, the stuff of this week is all extra credit. If it seems complicated, it is. As you see me making mistake live, it is. So well, eventually when the final project comes in, comes up, you're not going to be required to add uh, character select. Um, if you get it to work, amazing. Maybe I'll throw in some extra credit. But all of this character select is all completely extra credit. We've spent so far today two hours getting this to work. It's working and start, start my game. Um, but all of that's extra credit. If you want to select a character to then be part of your game to appear in different points, that's all extra credit. This inventory system we had covered on Monday. If you want the inventory heads up display and all of that to work, that was extra credit. So everything for this week, this Monday and Wednesday, what we've covered this week is all extra credit. 
uh, for eventually for the final project. And it works, it works. It's some great extra stuff for extra credit. The main stuff that will be required, well, you have the week five assignment, which most of you did and were already graded. You have the week seven, which is due next week. The requirements are there. It's just more of this navigation that it properly works, basically, that the endings work to restart or exit, that the boss, mini boss path works, that the random death path works, nothing about music. So eventually on the final project, your music needs to work. Maybe one more thing that your graphics work and everything. And then the extra credit will be character select and inventory inventory system. Cut scenes, cut scene, um, also extra credit, I guess, because it relies on the, ideally it relies on your, which character you selected, the cut scene will change based on which character you selected. We then might get to the question, okay, well, we made these characters to select and we and these various characters have these various hit points and luck and all that stuff. How do I use that? Good question. We're out of time for today. But the point is that now that we have all of these abilities to select a character, and I'm currently playing with the character that has luck of 100%, how do then I add that to the game? That's going to require all the setup of, I need to uh, pick the correct item and my luck level makes it easier for me to pick up the item, whereas I have a low luck level, it's more of a chance I fail. Or let's say that mini boss, if it detects that my hit points are 50, now the, now the hit points of the boss will be 10, uh, 20 clicks instead of 10. If my um, power is, is lower, then maybe the hit points of the mini boss are also lower. How do you do that? Well, again, dozens of lines of code. But uh, at this point, at least, we've got a lot going on for our project. Yeah. Um, I don't know if any of you have been showing these things to your friends or family and such or anyone else just to see how it's working so far. Uh, one of the last things to cover also is, again, of course, putting it on a real device. So on the final lecture, final wrap-up next week, Monday, final wrap-up, final putting it on device, and as I said, that'll be relatively short next Monday. Short lecture, lab time. Next Wednesday, completely all day lab time. If you want to come and work, great. If you want to do it at home at the beach, great. Then Monday the 29th, complete day of work. Wednesday, complete day of work. And then the final project eventually will be due on the 4th. So this week is the final for this, this week is, an, is a week of extra credit. Next Monday is a final day of a final polish. Work time for one and a half weeks. Therefore, no excuse for all of this to not work and look nice. Obviously, the code part is the big important stuff. And you saw there that I uh, threw together some very quick graphics for my... Um, for my characters, I want to make those look nice, but the important part is that the code works. I have selected a character. Uh, so for eventually for the final project, the big focus is that the code works. If you create Disney level animation here and Pixar level graphics and Studio Ghibli level plot, I don't care. The code has to work. And I've seen for a lot of you, you you're very artistically talented. Now you need to show me your logically talented, logically um, focused. And you don't have to be an expert on all of this, of course, but at the very least, all of this has to work code-wise. And of course, it's all in the lectures. My example code, I'm going to upload it. You can always refer to it. We've got the week seven due next week, and then in two weeks, the final project. Summer's over already, I can't believe it.